Well, welcome everyone to a webinar from Help Systems. Ah, I said it right away off the beginning. It's now Fortra. We had a name change, November 2nd. Um, rest assured, it was only a name change. And uh, to really help drive home the fact that you know, Help Systems had become a cybersecurity company, but not many people knew that. And with the name change, Fortra, we're really trying to drive home that message. Now, how does robot schedule or scheduling fit into cybersecurity as a company and will it still be a focus? Well, if you know the world of cybersecurity, there's a shortage. There's somewhere in the odds of like 3 million people that are needed in the cybersecurity workforce today. And how are we going to get those? Well, in my mind, automation has always been a big part of helping people out. And you should be using robot schedule on your IBM I platform to help you with your cybersecurity automation, whether it's reporting or buttoning up holes or whatever it may be, uh, think about this tool as a tool that can help you out. And when you get off IBM I, of course we have products like Automate and Jams um, besides that can also help you out with that. So that's just a little uh, plug about automation and cybersecurity. And today we're here to talk about our favorite features or our top 10 features. Uh, in the job scheduling tool, robot scheduling, what it can do and mean to your daily lives on the IBMI platform. Chuck, what do you do for help systems? Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. If you're listening elsewhere, uh, I've been with help systems now for going on 25 years and uh, focused strictly on uh, the power server, IBMI uh, operations automation, as well as cybersecurity on IBMI. Uh, so, uh, happy to talk to you about robot schedule today. And Tom, I'm going to turn my webcam off and save the world a little bandwidth. Yeah, I was getting a little notice on my end. But yeah, Tom Huntington, um, Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions at Help Systems. Uh, Chuck is very active in our local Q user, Q user group. I'm active in the IBM Power community and I'm an IBM I Power Champion, have been now for seven years. Looking forward to year eight. Hopefully, they won't kick me out of the program, but uh, excited to be with you here. Um, my background in robot schedule goes back all the way to the system 38 days. I had a great new job back in the time frame when the AS400 marketplace came out because I came to then help systems. And as we said earlier, today we are now Fortra. If you have any questions about that, feel free to send those in the chat too. So let's talk about best practices for scheduling first. And I'm going to take uh, the first part of this, Chuck. Uh, you you should really only have one scheduler when it comes down to it. Um, having multiple schedulers is a, a problem for people. Um, if you want to do any kind of reporting or see what's going to run, you have to look at multiple places and it becomes a headache. So, you know, we said earlier about using uh, scheduling with cybersecurity, for example, versus using maybe some other scheduling tool for your security type things. You should really consider getting everything into one scheduler. Event driven, it's always better if it's event driven. Um, goes without saying, event driven, reactive jobs, dependencies, whatever you wanna call them, prerequisites, file watchers, all those things that we hear in the industry. This is what really makes the enterprise scheduling aspect of getting things done on a timely fashion a reality is using event driven. And then don't overcomplicate things, keep it simple. Um, when something, I've always said over the years, if something sounds complicated, it is, let's step back from it, let's think about it, let's come up with a simpler solution. And then be granular in your setup. We wanna make sure that we can restart things and rerun things at a process level or job level versus one big job. Over the years I've seen customers say, oh, I automated everything. They got one big CL that runs, you know, 400 things, you know, and that's just, you know, not the best way to go about automation. And then dynamic parameters. Make sure your team knows about dynamic parameters. Stop having your developers create routines that automate the parameters and stuff. Just use what's built into the enterprise scheduling solution, robot schedule. And then, of course, as I said earlier, work with the other teams from an automation standpoint. Cybersecurity business, of course, and the developers to so make sure they understand what robot schedule can do for you or automation can do for you. Chuck, over to you for the latter half. 
Yeah, so about once a month, I'd say I talk with a, uh, a prospective uh, robot schedule uh, contact who had an issue at night. Uh, for instance, they've got a, uh, some batch processes that run on IBM I, and they've got some processes scheduled on a Windows server someplace in the Windows task manager. And for some reason, uh, the task manager jobs didn't finish on time and their IBM I jobs kicked off. And lo and behold, uh, they came in in the morning and they had to rerun their evening uh, job schedule because they use what, what, I, what we would call timer jobs. All right, so you've got your uh, your IBM I jobs that run at 8 o'clock at night, and prior to that, your Windows jobs must complete before that. And really what you've got is a disaster waiting to happen, uh, and likewise, wasted resources, because maybe you schedule the two processes on those two platforms uh, an hour apart just to make sure that uh, one is complete before the other kicks off, and uh, uh, you might have 45 minutes of wasted time or more. So eliminate those timer jobs, part of the event-driven scheduling uh, built into robot schedule. Another topic that we discuss on occasion is the use of automation. In other words, using a robot job to monitor the success of automation. So with the scripting tools that are built into robot schedule, specifically Opal, you can run a job to monitor other jobs uh, to monitor when a job starts up. Even if it starts up outside of robot, you could monitor that inside of robot schedule. Bet you didn't know that. Uh, management by exception is uh, something that we pound the drum on again and again. Um, there's no reason to verify that every single batch process has executed when really what you should be doing is setting up notifications so that if something doesn't run or if there is an issue, then you get notified. So notification is part of this uh, list as well. And the other thing, and I, Tom, you know, you've talked about this for many years, is uh, <laughs> keeping the automation list. You know, put keep your automation hat on and keep a list of those things that should be automated. And you know, I love it when I talk to robot schedule customers and they say, uh, it's kind of set it and forget it. We just put it into robot and we think about if we're going to do anything more on the system, we're going to make sure it's automated and we let robot handle it. That's the perfect attitude, Chuck. I love it. So let's take us over to our polling question here, Chuck. What are your top 10 scheduling challenges? Yeah, what are your top are... scheduling challenges? Is it is it the dependency processing, incorporating those dependencies either native on IBM I or maybe cross-platform? Uh, how about your IT audits? I know those can be painful. Uh, supplying data to the auditors for those IT audits that you are subjected to. How about uh, passing parameters properly? Do you have to code some kind of uh, parameter passing routine for your batch processes? Uh, how about locking down the job schedule so nobody can change run parameters, so nobody can change uh, the schedule of a job, et cetera, any other parameters on your job? And then last but not least, troubleshooting. All right, and the votes are coming in. Very interesting. And we could probably come up with more, but uh, oh, we yeah. only have five options in Google webinar, so uh, we do. <laughs> I'm sure. We do. Let's close that and I'll share out the results. This is kind of interesting, Tom. So we've got 71% uh, um, of our uh, respondents say incorporating dependencies, also at the top 71 percent is troubleshooting batch processes and passing parameters wow and a little bit hmm. lower is the uh reporting and securing the job schedule so yeah. right on topic i'm going to hide that and we can forge ahead yeah we'll make sure we address those things as best we can this is our agenda and it looks rather long because we have top 10 so we're going to talk about history regulations good morning reports sla features converting, scheduling, um, fiscal calendars, today's business date, dynamic parameters. What's happening? What's happening, Chuck? Scheduling activity monitor, yikes. <laughs> How do we understand the dependencies? Okay, no problem, we got automated dependencies. All right, that's the order we're going. So I'm gonna kick off the first one, history for each job. Oh my gosh, you know, 
And when I came over to, at the time, Help Systems, now Fortra, um, I came here and said, oh, I wish that I could do this and I wish that I could do that. And one of the things I wished for was that I could go right from a job into history. And so, um, you know, being able to do problem determination by having the history right at your fingertips is really important. So it saves you time and troubleshooting, it gives you the quick access to the job logs and history logs. Um, you, we use that internal history for forecasting, predicting how long is a process gonna run? Is it running longer than normal? We use the historical reporting for your audits, job warnings, job monitors, and um, many of the reports that are in Robot Schedule pull from the history that's inside the product. Now we tie into the operating system history too, like history logs and job logs, okay? So when we look at the, the GUI um, inside Robot Schedule or Green Screen, you have the ability to go from the job to the job information. So here we're looking at the historical information and what we call the job completion history. And by the way, a lot of little handy little things here, you can filter this and filter for certain jobs, certain types of jobs, applications. But once we get to a job, we can then drill into that job. We can look at the job log. We can print the log. We can look at QHIS. We can look at the spool files, the job attributes, depending upon the status of the job. You know, even if you're using um, Robot Schedule Enterprise, I can look at the Windows log and the IBMI log associated with the job. Or if I'm using the interactive tool Robot Replay, I can see all those informations and on the has the the parameters have passed so very good information here and then you know maybe i need to build a report so i could select all this and i could copy it to my clipboard drop it into a spreadsheet and give it over to the auditor yeah speaking of audits chuck over to you talk about audit for the jobs yeah, excellent. So this is a feature that didn't always exist in Robot Schedule, and I remember when we added it, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. So why did we add it? Well, you know what? It kind of came out of the WorldCom Enron debacle and the Sarbanes-Oxley regulations that came out of that. So what we're talking about is auditing the changes that happen to a, a robot job. So whether somebody changes the command at a job, somebody changes the status of a job, maybe puts it on hold, uh, somebody changes the schedule of a job, somebody deletes or adds a job, all that is documented in robot schedule. And uh, I think the graphical interface course is the best place to uh, pull that information from. Now just think, Tom, think, of the organizations that use robot schedule. Of course, there's a lot of manufacturers and uh, logistics type companies, but likewise, a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions, insurance companies, and so forth use robot schedule and they use the audit trail to prove that when a change occurs in their uh, documented change control system, they can prove now when the job was changed, who changed it, what was changed, and they can tie that right back to their change control audit. So, you know, those those change control practices are here to stay and thank goodness too, uh, you know, that we just don't go willy-nilly uh, changing our, uh, our configuration on IBMI. And of course the benefit uh, to going to robot is, hey, if you're just using the native scheduler on uh, IBMI, uh, you're not gonna get that, that audit trail. So how do we look at the audit trail? Once again, here in the graphical interface, under reports and system setup, you will see an audit log report. And this is probably the best way to look at the data in the audit trail. First of all, you can specify a date and a time range. You can specify jobs and user profiles, but down in the omit area, you can omit certain profiles. So if you're just looking at information for, um, um, uh, let's say an admin or an operator who is responsible for manipulating the job schedule, you can go ahead and omit the robot profiles, RBT admin user and RBT ent user, because we're not auditing just what's happening by an outside user to robot schedule. We're also auditing any changes in the robot database by robot itself. So here we're looking at any updates or user actions, and we wanna see a full report. All right, let's take a look and see what it 
what it tells us. So in this case, we're looking at a, a job called Monitor Job 3, MTR Job 3. Somebody released the job. It was on hold. That's the before. It's not on hold anymore. Okay, well, we could find out exactly who did that as well. Uh, and on the next job, you can see it's a, a MTR Job 4, same thing. We took it off of hold. All right, and it says who took it off hold? It was Chuck. All right, and likewise, the last one, we actually changed the command in a job and it was done on the green screen, QPA dev 001. And it uh, looks like I commented out a command in the robot job. So you've got irrefutable evidence of who changed your robot job. Audits are important. We got to pass them. Hey, what about the good morning report? Because you know a lot of people use that too for helping to pass the audit. And it's something that we added in the product many years ago. But the purpose of this was to summarize your schedule for a period of time. The last month, the last six months, depending upon how much history that you have. Um, people use it, as I said, to pass audits. But we also have the ability on there, if you take a little closer look at the good morning report, we can help you out too with um, run durations and forecasts. If you maybe have, again, some SLAs you got to meet, um, we can take and show you things like jobs that ran 20% longer than they normally run or outside the forecast. And of course, we can generate reports that just show jobs that ended in error or abnormal terminations, those kinds of things. So, Good Morning Report is a really uh, solid part of what Robot Schedule brings to the table. Um, you know, you can see this in a report format. We also have some of this information all stored and summarized and consolidated for those customers using Robot Network. Uh, we can consolidate it across multiple uh, partitions of Robot Schedule running out there. And this example here, we're just showing a time range of just one day, basically, number of jobs we ran, which you guys are probably laughing about, 175 jobs. We had 10 that failed. Not a very good day. It wasn't a good morning for our perspective. But then here at the lower half, we show the jobs that ended up normally. Obviously, in our test environment, I mean, you know, we got customers that are running millions of jobs in, in a given period of time. So, um, pretty pretty crazy. But I like this. You know, run de deviation, inside outside uh, forecasting. You can use those features to help you out in pinpointing things that are growing in your schedule. SLAs are important, aren't they? They are, and you know, this was kind of a follow-on to the the Good Morning report. Um, we wanted to add some service level agreement product. And I remember when this was added along the way. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, basically replacing the function of someone having a run book. And uh, the operator has to go along in the run book and check off each job as they're ran and if they ran completely and did they run on time and, and so forth. So with this feature in Robot Schedule called Job Monitors, you can, on any job in Robot Schedule, send out notification or at least log in the history file that Tom already showed us if a job ran too long, ran too quickly, or didn't get started on time or didn't end on time. All right. Now, as part of that um, processing, we can also compare the history to the forecast. And we built a command called forecast jobs missed that can help you automate that uh, checking of reality to forecast. All right. Uh, you can also use, I mentioned this right up front, you can also use a robot schedule job to monitor other robot schedule jobs or even other jobs on the system. And you can use uh, Opal in robot schedule to uh, manage that. So in other words, we're really using automation basically to monitor itself. We want to make sure that uh, you know nobody is having to manually go about monitoring the workloads on your system when a robot can do that. So. Uh, what I like to recommend is for your end of day jobs or end of week, end of month, whatever, that you set job monitors at certain milestones. You don't have to put job monitors on every job, but certainly uh, those milestone jobs, like for instance, maybe your daily backup, maybe that's the first step in your uh, nightly process. So in this case, I've got an overrun specified of five hours. So if the job doesn't run 
uh, or doesn't complete after five hours when it gets started, we're going to send out notification via robot alert. And likewise, at the bottom, this is very important, I've got a late start detector. All right, so if my job doesn't get started by 8.30, once again, I'm going to send out notification. I'm also, I'm just going to end the job because maybe it's stuck in a job queue and I don't want it to interrupt my nightly processing. And that late start information is actually based on the internal forecast. We're going to talk more about that. You know, Chuck, one of the things that we added a few years ago was this command forecast jobs miss. And I think a lot of people missed it along the way, speaking of miss. <laughs> but the idea is that you can schedule this as an every job, run it every 15 minutes, run it every 30 minutes. And what it'll do is it'll look at your forecast and generally it's building off the internal forecast and it will um, look at a date and time range if you want. And then it has notification capabilities along with reporting. If we were to scroll to the next page, you can generate a report. But the fact of the matter is we can, notify you in robot alert, robot network, or a message queue that there's certain jobs that are outside of the norm. We did that because people were checking jobs off manually. One of Tom's least favorite things in the world to hear from a customer is that there's somebody there checking jobs off manually. Um, that's a mundane task that, uh, you know, I don't want to put you out of business or put you out of a job, but there's got to be better things to be doing. And um, that's the idea behind this. All right, converting um, IBM I scheduling over to uh, robot. Let's talk about that. So again, I said earlier, best practice one scheduler. And really, you know, I just I have a call coming up next week with a customer that um, is using our Go Anywhere product, our robot schedule product, and they're like, oh gosh, I wish we'd have just used robot schedule to run things. Uh, Go Anywhere's got great scheduling in it, but now their problem is forecasting. They don't know when file transfers are happening in conjunction with batch processes and you know do yourself a favor get rid of all the other schedulers whether it's cron task scheduler you know etc and have one scheduler um, it's going to help you out with today's regulations going to help you out with management reporting and of course that whole enterprise scheduling concept of windows unix linux and ibm i so we've included in robot schedule for quite a few years now the robot convert job scheduler so this is a free scheduler that comes with ibm i that we um, can bring those in and i'll demo that later on if we have some time but that's just a command built in really nice you can just harvest your jobs we put them on hold we also can bring in the advanced job scheduler ags uh, jobs into uh, robot schedule convert them all right in we provide an audit log again on that process and then Oh, wow. Since the 90s, we've had this handy little command called Robot Start Learn that runs from a green screen. Actually, these all run from green screen. And um, that will learn all the jobs that are being submitted to batch. And uh, so when you go through a menu system and it does a submit job, we can intercept that and create a robot job out of it. Very handy uh, set of commands. Over to you, Chuck, to talk about calendars for fiscal All right, uh, Tom and Chuck's number five on the list, calendars. Uh, yes, the countdown. I forgot about the countdown. That's the countdown. important. Countdown. Drum roll, please. Number five. Okay, so so uh, the, the ability to create custom calendars and a robot schedule has been there pretty much forever. And the whole idea is that some businesses do run processing based on a fiscal calendar. So different accounting cutoffs uh, rather than a standard um, Monday through Friday type end of week, end of month calendar. So you can build in those fiscal date processing calendars into robot. And then you can you can specify that calendar then on your robot job and then you can use your standard first day of the fiscal period last day of the fiscal period and so forth um, on your jobs and keep in mind that robot schedule was designed to be very object oriented so when you create something like a calendar that can be shared between jobs so that is that is global and you can also use calendars in reserve command variables to do some additional calculations so to uh, create a calendar, this happens to be uh, my fiscal 22 calendar. And what you're seeing here actually are the holidays also. That's something uh, that you can specify. So what, so on certain holidays, for instance, uh, bank holidays, you may not want your processing to run. 
All right, so one of the options on a robot schedule job is to say, okay, if the job is supposed to run on uh, Monday, January 17th, uh, we're just not gonna run it that day. But you can also specify, you know what, if that job only runs on Monday the 17th, you can have it automatically reschedule itself to run the day before or the day after. Very cool. Yeah. And then, you know, the next topic being dynamic parameters, and the reason I say the next topic, number four, is that dynamic parameters use a lot of the date utilities that we use within robot schedule to calculate dates. So um, what we did uh, quite a few years ago is create some example reserve command variable programs, and we give you the source code for it. They're in a source file in robot Live. You have to know a little bit about CL programming to use these, and or you can use them as is and pass in different parameters. So the idea behind this is to deliver in dates manually each and every day. So we can use reserve command variables to plug them in, and you can change data areas or you know files, but you can build your own. So you can have the next invoice number, the next cash draft number, things like that that you could have generated automatically. So there's a command interface, there's interactive interface, it's in the green screen, it's in the GUI, it also is in Opal, which we haven't talked about. It's also used in file event monitoring, so you can say, hey, look for this file, but append a date, because you know, we change the file date every time we put this in the IFS. And as I said earlier, dynamic or constant, okay? So that's kind of cool reason for that, because um, what we can do is we can come in, we can use our command in robot schedule called robot change reserve variable. By the way, I can use that in a robot schedule job and change a value. So some people might use that to change the business date. First job that runs for night processing is change the business date, Chuck, and they just hard code that in, and then everything else uses whatever that at at date is, or at eight, in this case, company number. Um, but then they can be dynamic. So in this case here, we like I said, we ship you the code uh, for calling this utility RBT013. And if you look at it, we're passing in parameters. So S means system date, minus means minus days, 007. So we can create a date range that's minus seven days based on the business date that you're running right now. Um, we could substitute in there S minus 14, S minus 31 to give you a kind of a month view if you want that. Um, but the idea is dynamic variables, they're yours. You can create as many as you want. Um, you can modify the ones that we have. If you use our programs, I would recommend you copy into your own libraries, good pr programming practice to do that. And um, here's just more examples of this. So uh, here we're showing you that we can use them in Opal, we can use them in you know, passing parameters into the good morning report to run you know, the, today's date minus one and then today's date as the range, that's the idea behind those. Um, in your program calls on a command line in robot schedule, I'm calling a program and I'm passing in at at date minus one. So today's date minus one. In Opal, we can use if then else processing with reserve command variables if you want to get a little more complicated. Uh, in the robot replay product, we can plug reserve command variables into interactive screens. So if you say, oh, I'd love to automate my night processing or this one process, we can't because it's an interactive screen. We can actually use Robot Replay, run that interactive screen, and plug in today's date, today's date minus one, whatever kind of dynamic parameter you want in there. And then even with agent jobs running over on Windows, they too, Chuck, can use reserve command variables. And here we're setting a, a value in an agent environment with uh, the uh, reserve command variable. So those reserve variables can be passed into a, um, you know, bat file or something like that over on the Windows side, whatever you're using for programming language. Yep. Robots. That was number four. Like, yeah, number four. Okay, we're 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 getting to the top three here. Uh, so let's talk about the schedule activity monitor. This feature is a, gr a GUI interface only feature. So if you've never used the graphical interface, and I know some of you out there have not used the GUI interface for robot schedule, this is one reason you might want to take a look and I'd be happy to spend some time with you to learn how to use it. So create your uh, jobs in green screen, use yep, the GUI for reporting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and people love dashboards. So this is really 
uh, robot schedule at a glance. I can just look at the, the uh, schedule activity monitor dashboard. It'll tell me how things are going. And it all starts with what's called the forecast. So every day at 11 a.m. and 11 p.m., robot generates an internal forecast that's fe that feeds into the schedule activity monitor and tells you what's going to run. And it looks at everything about a job. It looks at the discrete scheduling, it looks at the dependencies, it looks at Opal, it looks at history and so forth to determine what is the forecast. And in uh, one dashboard, it tells you here's what's going to run, here's what's active or waiting to run or may have an issue. And then here's what's completed for the day, all in three columns. And from there, Tom's favorite feature is to drill into the history and drill in even to the job logs. So as far as troubleshooting, very quick and easy to do in the schedule activity monitor. It's a great operational dashboard. Tom, let's take a look at it. Sounds right. good. Oh, we're actually gonna we're gonna demo this live, but here's here's a little tip. Yeah, we're uh, not gonna show it here. We're gonna show them how to run it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Uh, in, in the robot schedule graphical interface, under tools, there's a preferences option. And there's a checkbox that says open schedule activity monitor on connect. And uh, so that's one way to get into the schedule activity monitor. Another way is the, use the little EKG icon, I call it, at the top uh, in the title bar. All right. And it gives you the pulse of what's going on with the robot schedule. And likewise, you can just right click on your system name and get into schedule activity monitor and, and uh, look, at, look at things that way. We, you know, another thing on that too, Chuck, is that you could say, here's my application and I want to see all the jobs just in that application in right. the schedule activity monitor. Like, you know, like so your nightly jobs or your backup jobs or your, your sales jobs, jobs. or sales. for a certain Windows server. I only want to see the jobs that are running on this Windows server um, through schedule activity monitor. So I have the ability to do all those things through there. Quick and easy. Yeah. Cool stuff, huh? All right, um, so flowcharts, job monitors, uh, job blueprints, uh, that's where we're at now. Um, they're really job flowcharts. That's, you know, we name things over the years and then we think about it and go, ah, we should just call it job flows, right? Or workflow, we hear that a lot too. Job flows get complicated if not laid out graphically. Um, trying to look at things on a textual screen um, is, is really tough. And, you know, you wanna be a hero with your development team, come in with the job blueprint laid out saying here's our night processing, here's how things are, are related to each other, and then you know really helps you as an automation team to see and modify existing uh, workflows and how things are put together. So job blueprints have been part of the product. Um, I could come up with probably a million enhancements for this area, but at the end of the day, it's a productivity tool. It's gonna save you time in doing those uh, Visio diagrams, which I occasionally have people still talk about. Um, but, you know, here's just, I, I just simply went out and uh, did a right click on Chuck's nightly processing, said, hey, run a blueprint, and it submits a batch job off, and then you can go over and view it, then you can modify and start moving things around, and I didn't finish that whole process here, because I kind of wanted to see a, show you a work in progress, and, um, but there's a legend up here where we can see what all the different various icons mean, the 10, the 20, the 30, obviously group job, you know, commands, uh, file monitoring you can see in here, you can save these, you can PDF them. Um, and then when you come back in, it's all laid out the way you wanted it before. So like here we have a file event. Um, yeah. You know, in our processing, Chuck, it sometimes gets a little complicated because we don't, we're, we're really just playing around, right? Well, you know, Tom, with, with blueprints or job flow diagrams, when I would do implementations, with with uh, customers, this would be the first thing that we would do. We would actually manually flow chart out their run book. And then mm. we would implement that into dependency processing. And that's our number one feature that we want to talk about is dependency processing. All right, so. All right, here we go. What are we Drum roll, about? please. Number one, we're on number, <laughs> number one. Number one, so. It's all about so dependencies, right? It's, it's about event-driven scheduling. So in robot schedule, I can trigger jobs downstream when my current job that's running completes. And I can trigger one job downstream, I can trigger multiple jobs downstream, I can trigger jobs to run later on. Maybe my prerequisite job runs at uh, nine in the morning, but that will trigger a downstream job that maybe isn't supposed to run until six o'clock tonight. So you can have some very complex dependencies 
that don't require staff to monitor prerequisite jobs. It can all be built into robot schedule. You can be very complex with it, as complex as you need to be. So for instance, here is an example of setting up dependencies. I've got a, a, a robot space summary job, a daily backup, and once a daily backup is done, that is the prerequisite for the nightly processing. When the nightly processing completes, it runs a bunch of other jobs. Some of those jobs only run, for instance, at month end. You can see one is a month end close process. One is a weekly process. And some of these prerequisites aren't just other robot jobs, they are events, file events on uh, in the IFS, file events that exist externally out on a Windows or Linux server, processing that runs out on a Windows, Windows Linux server, we're talking about completely eliminating those error-prone cross-platform timer jobs using robot schedule dependencies. Very cool. One of the more favorite features there. So let's do this. Let's uh, minimize the PowerPoint. Um, we have the hey, look at that. Up. Robot schedule. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, there's robot schedule GUI. But I want to bring up my good friend, Mr. Green Screen, first here. And oh. um, yeah, hopefully you can see that okay, Chuck. Can. Yeah, looks good. Can. Yep, yep, yep. So, you know, if I want to get into robot, I just do RBO and I can get into robot schedule and I can see all my jobs and all that stuff, right? Right, right, right. That's good. But, you know, on some systems, um, we also have things that are in work job schedule entry, right? So things like this. So I have a couple of jobs out there that I'm going to harvest and bring in to robot schedule because I'm believing in what Tom says, one schedule, that's what I want, right? So um, we have a command, RBT convert job schedule entries. I've already brought in this job number four, I believe. So I'm going to do this job number five, and when I do that, it starts converting it. Um, it actually generates a, a spool. Uh, tell you um, that we did this and, and we learned in that particular job. Now, I think my audio might have dropped out, so I'm gonna just do one more uh, job here, Chuck. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? For, yeah, just for 10 seconds it dropped out. Okay. So let's do, we do Tom import, okay? So now I brought those jobs in and that was done in the green screen. Again, there's a conversion for AJS too and there's this here and there's also the robot uh, uh, start learn command that we talked about earlier. Again, one of my favorites, long time favorite product. If you go into a menu system, submit something, uh, we can actually create a robot schedule job out of it. And those things show up in the GUI, right? So here I am with all jobs. And now if I type in Tom, um, there's my uh, Tom import job, and it should summarize it here in a little bit. We'll see that it's on hold already, or where did I go? My other one was this job, five right here. And again, that one too, when I click on it, it's on hold. So we import them, we put them on hold. So then after they're in robot schedule, um, I could go in and say, you know, this job here, I want to make this uh, dependent on this job four so I can go in and do that dependency thing that Chuck talked about. So if I go to reactivity and say add a robot job because now this job is just job four is in here, I can say okay. And now those two jobs are dependent on each other. And then uh, notice too that all of a sudden we have a little arrow here showing that. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Schedule activity monitor. As we said, a couple of different ways you can do that. Um, I can come in here and I can run the schedule activity monitor from here. I can run it from an application. So I can come here and I could say schedule activity monitor from here. So I could basically, it's pre-built filtering. Um, I can run it from an agent. So I could come down here or here and do a right click and I can run schedule activity monitor just for a certain Windows server or I can look for Chuck's heartbeat here and I can click on it here. So that's what I'm going to do. So schedule activity monitor comes up again. This is uh, obviously only in the graphical interface. The graphical interface is free. Go out to the Fortra community and download it. You can download it and run it from your desktop. Now, right away, we see this is what's forecasted to run today. I can look at the forecast. I can see what's coming up. I can, um, I even have, there are some other things we can do here. So if something, doesn't run, I can actually come in here and, and check things off too. So 
and I can go, I think I accidentally clicked on properties. So I can go right into the properties of the job of I'm authorized to. Um, what I meant to show you is that I could actually uh, check off a job for this forecast. You know, maybe I have a, a forecasted job. And here I can see a jobs in error. Um, this particular job, if I were to look at the job log, um, is in QSIS Upper message weight right now. Uh, we schedule that just to show you. You can see errors. Um, over here, we have a job that has completed. These are all my completed jobs. There's some um, little bit of, I can rerun that internal forecast if I add a bunch of new jobs. I have some preferences up here. Um, I can eliminate every jobs from here or show them if I want to. I could say uh, show all jobs or I could say show all jobs that failed today and do that. And now I'm going to get a different view. Uh, well, hey, we're having a great day. Only one job has failed. And when I go into it, I can go into the spool files, basically a job log and do some problem determination here on this particular job and find out you know, why did it fail? I don't know. Tom, that was quick, and easy. quick and easy. That was, yeah, yeah. And so the other part of it too is I can select all this, copy it and I can send it over to my favorite developer and say, hey, look, fix your program. It blew up again <laughs> last time. Never happens, right? How are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Last thing we wanted to show was blueprints. Ah. All right, so whenever you're working with, um, you know, like a group job, um, I'm going to pick on your group, Chuck, and I'm sure. just going to submit it because it's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, so I come down here, I can submit a blueprint, all right? And I could do that for any of these group jobs, any reactive job, um, any of my file monitors. So I could come over here to scheduling objects. Again, this is only in the GUI, your invent monitors. And I can come in here and right click and I could say, I want to submit that guy out there too. So then once I've submitted them, I can click on the blueprint tab here. And now we can see that was just submitted today. It'll show me the events associated with it. Um, if I see something gray, I can do a reload on it in the blueprint and see if there's anything. So these, this is a pretty simple process. Do this, this file comes in, it's going to run this process. That's basically what that's saying. There's a little legend here. Okay, with all these different means, event monitor, green is a robot schedule job, um, and uh, so forth. Okay, so now I'm going to save it. So then next time I come back in, it'll be nicely laid out. And now we want to go find the job CL nightly. We've run that a few times. The latest one was the 16th. And, um, you know, like I said, Chuck's got a lot going on. So I would spend some time formatting this, moving things around. I can highlight, I can move things around like that. I yeah, just you might want to add a text box to it somewhere. Oh, you want me to add a text box? How do I do that? Right click? click. I'm just kidding. I can create yeah. a comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, add some comments. Yeah. Come on. It, you know, I'm doing all these demos and stuff. This this is a comment. You said add a comment. Excellent. So, yeah. I'm not very <laughs> creative. I think I can move that around too. So, you know, maybe I want to document it. Um, but, and then I also, if I have authority, I can go right into the properties of the job from here. I can look at the job completion history. I can remove jobs. Um, so that is blueprint and that is ta -da, the time right. we have for our live demo. Back to we're gonna, our- yeah. oh, We're gonna launch. Chuck. Tom, I launched, I launched the polling question. Uh, a little bit of follow-up, okay. if you'd like a security scan, maybe a health check, we'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one uh, -on -one and take a look at the products that you have installed and uh, let you know how you're doing. Uh, we do what are called tech updates. So we talk about uh, new things that are happening in the robot product line or power tech or whatever products you happen to have and introduce you to some of our other cybersecurity products. We could, we'd be certainly uh, more than happy to do a robot schedule demo for your team if they aren't maybe getting the most out of it. We'd be happy to talk to you. Or if you need some services, we can do that as well. Tom, we have a question. And the question we have is, a question. Can, we, yes. Any, and if anybody else has any questions, please send those in. Uh, the question is, we only have about 30 seconds. Can I schedule a Microsoft SQL procedure or job using robot schedule? Tom. Yes, you can if you have our robot schedule enterprise. So robot schedule enterprise, and I think you got the polling question up, so I can't quite show you right here yet, Ricardo, but once we close the polling, I'll be able to show you. So answer quickly. Um, <laughs> 
we have the ability inside Robot Schedule Enterprise to put an agent on your Windows servers. And now one of the things that's integrated is SSIS packages. So we can run SQL um, SQL um, SSIS packages right from Robot Schedule, or we can run any script that you might have over on a Windows server that you want to run, like a bat file or some other, whatever your programming language of choice is, we can, we can run those things through there. We can also do that in Linux. We also can integrate with Unix. So the unique thing is uh, nobody else in the world does it that way. Uh, we do enterprise scheduling from IBMI. Why not? IBM is always up and running, right? I mean, it's a, Tom, I think you, you quoted somebody recently. IBM I is a competitive advantage. It is. Yes. I talked to a customer yesterday. Don't tell anybody we're on IBM I because it's our competitive advantage. So yeah. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting to hear. Yeah. So Ricardo, yes, you can. Um, Chuck, you want to, did you close the poll? You did, I did huh? close the poll. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, um, first of all, if you think about help systems, we are backup and recovery, HA, document management, cybersecurity. Um, we are monitoring business intelligence, capacity planning, and automation as we've been talking about robot schedules. So when you look at IBM I, remember that Fortra help systems is more than what meets the eye. We're not just robot schedule. We are many other things on the IBM I platform. And then if I bring up my... Where did my remote desktop go and robot schedule? Um, we will see down here for Ricardo's purposes, we have agents out there and um, I can look at, for instance, this guy right here. And um, this is a Windows server. And then I can come up here and I can see jobs by agent. And if I were to go, let's see yeah. here. I'll look at that job we'll see in the command area that we're actually running, um, you know, Windows change directory, send badge, echoes, um, but then there's also an add-in function, built-in function here, excuse me, for SQL server jobs. So we can run SQL server jobs from, from here, okay? But you do need the robot schedule enterprise piece. Uh, your GUI won't show that unless you own that, um, but it's fairly, I'll say, relatively inexpensive to do that. Easy for me to say, right? Or is it the season of giving, Chuck? <laughs> it's got a good payback. It's got a good payback. Yep, let's uh, tame those other servers. So we thank you for the questions today. We thank you for joining us on the top 10 features that we would be using in Robot Schedule. Obviously, there's many, many more that we didn't talk about today. Uh, first of all, I recognize a lot of names out there, so I want to thank you for being customers. It is the season of being thankful, so sure. be thankful. We're very fortunate to be um, on the IBMI platform. Thank you. All right, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.